the final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 11626 in the name of Ian Gray on Learned Societies Group on Scottish Science Education Report. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if members who would like to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. I call on Ian Gray to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Gray. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding uh, Officer. Uh, we all like uh, to think of Scotland as a, a great science uh, nation with a proud history of scientific achievements, uh, enough to fill many tea towels uh, over. Uh, but in this particular year, uh, I wanted to start by illustrating that with uh, a passing reference to uh, perhaps one of the greatest shining lights of her scientific past, James Clark Maxwell, because uh, this year marks the 150th anniversary uh, of the publication of Maxwell's uh, treatise, A Dynamical Theory of the Electromagnetic Field, one of the most important publications uh, ever in science, and the, the equations included uh, therein, just as important as the perhaps more famous E equals MC squared uh, from Einstein uh, later on. Uh, 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 quantum mechanics, the foundations of which did indeed lie with James Clark Maxwell's uh, very work. But Clark Maxwell uh, was not just a, a, a great uh, researcher and theoretical uh, physicist. He was a teacher, too. He lectured uh, first at, uh, the, at Marshall College, the predecessor of the University of Aberdeen, and indeed gave pro bono lectures in that city, too, to the local uh, working men's college. So as well as a proud history in uh, science, we have a proud history in science teaching, and the two, of course, uh, are fundamentally related. It is in science teaching that I have a, 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 the history of science teaching, and it is history, a small part myself, uh, not quite as uh, illustrious as James Clark Maxwell's, but I did start professional life uh, as a, a physics teacher. And uh, although that experience, uh, and indeed my GTC registration, lies far back in the dim and distant past, my passion for science and uh, excitement which uh, learning about science can provide for young people remains undiminished. So it was that when the Learned Societies Group published their report back in November, uh, I found the, the, the results of their survey uh, of science teaching in our schools and the resources there uh, quite alarming. That survey, the first in about 10 years, shows that 82% of our schools report that they do not have sufficient resources uh, for science teaching. Uh, that is simply related to funding, and it, it is a fact shown in the survey uh, that uh, uh, funding per pupil of science teaching in our secondary schools is around a third less uh, than it is in uh, England, for example, and in primary schools the situation is worse, uh, with the funding being around half the level which one could expect in a primary school uh, in England. 98% uh, of the uh, schools surveyed uh, said that they were drawing on external funding uh, in order to uh, marshal enough resources uh, to teach science, and that often meant uh, from the pockets of science teachers themselves. And those pockets are uh, neither deep nor numerous, because not long after the uh, Learned Society's report, the Institute of Physics produced a further report which looked at physics graduates and their careers. And it demonstrated that uh, uh, in their survey, uh, those physics graduates who had become teachers were the poorest paid uh, section of uh, those, uh, those who were surveyed. And as a result, uh, there is an impending shortage now of physics teachers, not helped by the fact that uh, other parts of the United Kingdom are providing financial incentives uh, for trainee teachers in STEM subjects, and we are losing uh, trainee teachers uh, to the rest of the United Kingdom. And it's not just teachers. Local government cuts, which we've just heard about in the budget debate, have seen school technicians and science departments uh, cut as well. But there are other concerns around science teaching, not just about resources. Uh, science teachers uh, have come to me uh, with concerns about uh, an unintended consequence of the introduction of Curriculum for Excellence, uh, an introduction which we, of course, do support. However, the way in which course choice is being implied in our schools uh, has led to a squeezing of science and math subjects. Uh, and there are real fears now that the number of pupils choosing these subjects uh, will uh, be reduced. Not helped 
uh, by the results of the first new national exams, which show significantly lower pass rates in science subjects than in some others, and a real fear among science teachers that pupils will therefore be discouraged from choosing these subjects <coughs> because, because of the long-standing belief that they are somehow too hard uh, and the result will be a reduction in classes, surely. Minister. I, I thank the member for giving way. I, I think governments are, are more accustomed to being criticised uh, when uh, pass rates are, are seen to be easy rather than when uh, standards, standards are clearly being uh, maintained. But can I ask him, what, what evidence does he have that teachers or anyone else in our system are discouraging young people from taking science subjects? Ian Gray. Well, uh, uh, two things there. The first is I did make clear that the evidence was at the moment anecdotal, and let me come to that at the, the end of my remarks, but it does come from teachers. And I have to say, I didn't suggest for a moment that teachers were discouraging students from taking science subjects, but rather uh, some of the uh, ways in which the school administration was working was making it more difficult for young people to choose one, two or three uh, science subjects. But the Minister mentioned standards there, and there is a problem with standards too, because the Scottish Government's own numeracy survey last year demonstrated a fall in uh, numeracy attainment in our schools as well. And of course, numeracy uh, underpins these uh, STEM subjects. We saw significant falls at P2, P4, uh, and something like 34% not achieving the required numeracy rates uh, in uh, S4 as well. And that is another uh, significant difficulty in our schools, which will have consequences for pupils being able to study STEM subjects. So in many ways, this is a, rather a perfect storm. Uh, a science teaching which is under-resourced, uh, where we face the situation of not enough teachers, potentially not enough pupils choosing STEM subjects, and a lack of the fundamental or dropping standards in the fundamental skills which pupils need to succeed in uh, these subjects. It threatens the, our future, not just as a science nation, but indeed our economy too. Uh, colleagues were at the uh, Institution of Engineering and Technology uh, event a couple of weeks ago, uh, where their report suggested that we will need 147,000 engineers in Scotland, and that's only engineers alone, by 2022 uh, in order to see the kind of growth in the economy that we want to see. I do not for one moment suggest that the Scottish Government is not committed to quality science teaching in our schools. I simply use this evening to draw attention to these reports which interlock and it suggests to us that there are problems developing around science education in our schools. And the time is now to actually take action. Next week, our Education Committee will have a session looking at this. But the truth is, these are problems which need more than a, a one-off evidence session. What we need is a plan for action to turn these problems around resourcing teachers uh, and any unintended consequences on course choices of curriculum change before it is too late, and so that we can see and hope and expect in the future to create more James Clark Maxwells who will maintain our reputation as one of the leading science nations of the world. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes or so, please. And I call Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and can I congratulate Ian Gray on securing uh, this debate. And can I also associate myself with the remarks he made about the towering figure that is uh, James Clark Maxwell. Since its creation in 2012, the Learning Societies Group on Scottish Science Education has carried a lot of very interesting work, including its latest report on the resourcing of science in Scottish schools. Last month, I met with William Hardy, Secretariat of the Learning Societies Group, along with Bristol Muldoon and Dr Bill Beveridge, to discuss the findings of their report. Now, as convener of the Education and Culture Committee, I'd like to inform members about the work our committee plans to undertake on science education. The committee has agreed to examine whether there are barriers to more people studying STEM subjects at school, college and university. And we also plan to look at the extent to which industry's needs for STEM skills are being met by the education system. Now, initially, the committee has invited the Learner Societies Group to discuss the findings of its report on the resourcing of science in schools at its meeting next week, as Ian Gray quite rightly mentioned. But we also intend to do further work as we will carry out further detailed evidence sessions later in the year looking into STEM subjects. 
Now, I very much recognise the Scottish Government's commitment to science education in Scottish classrooms, but at this point I want to take the opportunity to put on record my support for the campaign to ensure that creationism or intelligent design have no place in the science classrooms of Scotland. Scientific fact or theory should be taught to our young people and not the ridiculous nonsense of those pushing the young earth fantasy. Presenting officer, decisions on resourcing are of course for education authorities and their schools. Though the work of the Learning Societies Group has been uh, very useful in identifying areas for improvement. However, we must not jump to conclusions given that the survey, uh, for example, only covered 2% of Scottish primary schools. Indeed, the report itself states that given the small samples, the findings should be read as providing an indication only of the Scotland wide picture. And secondly, of course, I think it's a, a fact that uh, among the surveyed schools, the average spend on science has increased from £280 in 12-13 to £343 in 13-14, representing a rise of 21%. And next year, the level of spend on science is estimated to grow by an average of 12.9% amongst the surveyed schools. So that's very welcome news indeed. But one area the report highlighted is the need to encourage more pupils to consider science-related careers by improving participation in practical science work uh, from an early age. However, the report indicated that a number of teachers, particularly in primary schools, reported having difficulty supporting practical science lessons due to a lack of resources and equipment. And I would expect this issue to be a key question for the Education and Culture Committee's work in the weeks ahead. However, our, our young people continue to excel at science, as evidenced by Aidan Miles and Murray Patterson, two pupils from Glenifer High in Paisley, who recently won the Best Quality Award in the Higgs Boson competition, organised by the Institute of Physics. Uh, last week, I hosted a reception in Parliament, again mentioned by Ingray, on behalf of the Institute of uh, Engineering and Technology to promote the need for more young people to take up STEM subjects at school and pursue careers in related industries. Now, during that reception, we heard from Naomi Mitchison, IET's Young Woman Engineer of the Year, who spoke passionately about the importance of taking steps to change perceptions about gender in the engineering industry. Naomi Mitchison is a talented and successful young engineer and I certainly hope that more ambassadors like Naomi are given the chance to speak about the benefits of taking up STEM subjects at school. Uh, presenting officer, excellent work is going on every day to promote science in Scottish classrooms. Last year, a teacher from Merns Primary in East Renfrewshire was awarded a Primary Science Teacher Award for his work in championing science to his pupils. Paul Tyler was given the accolade by the Primary Science Teaching Trust for his inspiring science lessons, which included building a wave generator and a tidal turbine to generate electricity. Schools across East Renfrewshire have been participating in the Science Champions Scheme, which is funded by the Scottish Government in order to offer teachers training and resources to promote science projects to pupils. And that, that project, that work and that funding takes place in about 50% of our local authorities. And again, I think very much a welcome programme by the Scottish Government. And, and finally, uh, presenting officer, Scotland has a proud history of scientific achievement. And our future success in the fields of science and technology will rely in no small part to the hard work being carried out by our teachers, and particularly teachers like Paul Tyler in classrooms right across Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Elaine Murray to be followed by Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I would like, like to start by congratulating Ian on uh, bringing this important subject to the Chamber. Uh, as he said, Scottish science has a good reputation. That has been the case for many de decades. Our scientists have excellent citation rates for their published work. And scientists from across the world are attracted to collaborate with or work at our universities. But we must not be complacent because a su successful future economy requires a workforce which is competent in the STEM subjects, as indeed Sir Ian Wood's recent report highlighted. Children and young people can be enthused about or turned off science at an early age. Teachers and family can either make or break a child's interest in science. And it's vital, therefore, that primary school pupils are introduced by science, to the sciences by teachers who are enthusiastic and competent. In their briefing to the Science in the Parliament conference last year, the Royal Society of Chemistry noted that despite Scotland's reputation for science, our overall rating for science education lags behind many of our international competitors, including England. Uh, and they suggested that there is a need to provide inspires, inspiring te a science teaching from an early age. They recommended that every primary school should have or have access to, in the case of small schools, a science subject leader who is a science specialist and who can provide the leadership on science teaching and indeed support 
for colleagues. A science specialist uh, doesn't have to be somebody who is a science graduate. It could be someone who has uh, at least one higher or equivalent in a science subject. It is surprising that the current minimum entry qualifications for a primary teaching requires England at SQF level six, which some of the older of us remember as hires. Uh, maths at SQF level five or standard or grade or even or grade for the even older of us. And in fact, has no requirement for any science qualification at all, despite the fact that science is in the curriculum. Uh, and they also recommended that there ne needs to be sufficient continuous professional development to ensure that teachers' knowledge and skills are kept up to date because science does change quickly. If a teacher has had a poor experience of learning science, perhaps gave up science at a fairly early age in their own school education, or maybe failed, failed a science qualification, they're not going to feel particularly confident about teaching it. And science teaching from the earliest age needs to be led by teachers with confidence and enthusiasm. It is spoken about the report on the resourcing of science in Scottish schools published by the Learning Society's Group on Scottish Science Education. That does make worrying reading. Uh, in debates on science, I often highlight my concerns about the lack of opportunities for children, even older students, to actually undertake experiments themselves. And so it's concerning to me that 44% of primary schools were dissatisfied with the funding available for practical work, and 82% of secondary schools were not confident of having enough equipment and consumables to deliver science practical work effectively. 44% of secondary schools were also dissatisfied with the level of technical support. Now, it would be unfair to suggest that responsibility for this situation rests only with the Scottish Government. Uh, it does rest, of course, with local authorities and individual schools. But I believe that these issues need to be tackled if Scotland is to remain a scientifically successful country. We do need to grow our own scientists and science technicians, as well as attracting excellent students and academics from other nations. So our schools must have to be up to the task uh, of doing this, uh, as indeed do our further and higher uh, in, uh, education institutes. I mean, I know that there is no money tree on the immediate horizon, uh, and this is, needs to be achieved against a background of financial restriction. Uh, but I believe it is actually an investment which is worth making uh, in terms of our future economy, because if we want to continue to be a scientifically su successful country, if we want to have that sort of input into our, to, our techno to be a sort of high wage, high experience, high qualification economy, uh, we need to be able to produce those scientists and science technicians. We need, therefore, because of the issues which uh, confront all of us, I think, to be able to engage with other partners. For increase, we need to uh, increase the level of private investment in research and development. And I can't remember the number of years we've been saying there's insufficient level of private investment in research and development, but it's still the case. Uh, and we also need to uh, encourage the offering of high quality scientific apprenticeships. And I think in going forward that that requires a promoting a consensus about the value of science and knowledge to the economy. And that it is in investing in science education right from the beginning, from primary school onwards, is actually investing in Scotland's future. Thank you. And I now call Liz Smith to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Could I begin by uh, thanking Ian Gray for bringing this uh, motion to uh, Parliament? Uh, I think it's a hugely important issue which highlights the very significant concerns of the Learned Societies groups, the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Royal Society of Physics. And indeed, it's very good to hear from the convener of the Education Committee uh, just the profile that this uh, subject will receive in the coming weeks. I think the academic bodies uh, which do so much to enhance the intellectual life of Scotland because their discourse is always... Uh, well balanced, it's always non-partisan, well evidenced and without exception, it's very thought-provoking. Uh, they have spoken out about the crucial challenge uh, which is facing the future of science teaching, especially when one considers that by the year 2030, some 7 million jobs across the UK will actually be directly dependent on science skills. Uh, unlike Mr Gray, I am not a scientist, but I have a very keen interest, interest in science teachers uh, and what they are saying. And I think he's right to identify that there are some issues about the curriculum for excellence. Some of them good, some of them uh, less so. And they certainly all have some very important messages uh, for us. I think everybody in this chamber is very well aware that science learning has traditionally been very content driven. I.e. knowledge of the facts has often mattered perhaps a little bit more than the learning process. Of course, it's true that there has always been a great deal of emphasis on basic numeracy, data handling skills, problem solving and research methodology, but the knowledge content has always tended to be uh, dominant in the traditional curriculum. 
Now, however, I think there's some interesting things happening in the SQA exams of what is called the open question, uh, which I think is designed to assess the candidate's science knowledge, but also from a much more holistic uh, point of view, and by its very nature, an open question that does not actually have one uh, correct answer. And I think that's a change of direction, which I warmly welcome in the curriculum for excellence. And I don't think there's any need uh, to... Uh, perhaps uh, get too worried about this because I think what the Curriculum for Excellence is trying to do is to come back to the cross-curricular uh, teaching of science subjects, uh, which I think is very important. Uh, I'm personally a very strong supporter of the baccalaureate system uh, of exams, but at the moment I don't actually believe that the Scottish baccalaureate has the necessary intellectual rigour uh, because uh, if we look at the uptake uh, rates, uh, they're not good uh, and they don't compare particularly well uh, with the international baccalaureate when it comes to much of that rigour. I think the disciplines of art, sciences and social sciences are all distinct, but they do inform each other. And I think there's a good movement within the Curriculum for Excellence uh, to look at how uh, that can come together. But nonetheless, there are specific problems and I think we need to take action. I think it's particularly important to start with the 2012 SEAG recommendations. Uh, the report said then that the Scottish Government had quite rightly identified energy and life sciences as two priority sectors but this was not translating as yet into successful STEM education. And I think the key question for the Education Committee will be, uh, given that these are priorities, why is this not being translated into action? Partly, it is because there is a lack of science uh, specialists, particularly in the primary schools, and Elaine Murray is absolutely right to point to that. I think the uh, Royal Society of uh, Chemistry made a very good call uh, towards uh, the end of uh, November about this. We do need science specialists in our <coughs> primary classrooms. But I think we can go uh, further, because I do believe that, whether politicians like it or not, uh, there is educational reform coming. It's coming because the needs of Scotland and our young people are changing, and they're changing fast, which is something that Sir Ian Wood has clearly identified, uh, particularly when it comes uh, to looking at a, what is now a fiercely competitive global economy. And could I just flag up something that uh, Lindsay Patterson in Edinburgh University uh, talked about very eloquently in a lecture he delivered at the David Hume Institute uh, last year, and that's about supporting our very gifted children, uh, whatever their backgrounds are, and particularly in the science subjects, there is a need, I think, to look at greater bursary support uh, for that. So there is no question about it that there is a lot that has to be done, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I think we uh, are on the cusp of doing some really exciting things in science, but not until we really grasp the thistle, uh, and that is about resources, and it's about the professional training of teachers and ensuring that they can inspire our youngsters. Thank you very much. And I now call Hans Alamalik to be followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you very much and good evening, Presiding Officer. Uh, I would like to thank Ian Gray for securing today's important debate. We have, seen, we have been aware of the low funding of science education in Scottish schools for some time now. However, I was still shocked to see the survey results which suggest that 98% of primary and secondary schools depend on external funding for practical work in science classes, which means that parents who can't contribute their children are disadvantaged, amongst others, which is uh, uh, clearly un un unfair and undesirable. I find it shameful that Scotland, which pr pr prides itself on being a home for great inventors such as James Watt and John Logan Baird, is spending significantly less per child on science subjects than in England. As many of you know, I have spoken on various occasions about the need to have more people studying science and technology in Scotland, particularly young women. Whereas some money and focus has been put at the end of the process of encouraging people to undertake science, technology, engineering and mathematics courses at university, we need to recognize that there is a need to be, have a pipeline of people who are engaging in science at all ages and all levels. You are not going to get someone choosing science, uh, so, uh, choosing to study uh, engineering at university if they never get the opportunity to conduct experiments uh, when they're young and in the classroom. I would like to thank Ingrain for focusing attention, particularly on the crisis in the teaching of physics, as physics is an essential base for going to study engineering at university level. 
While I ask the Parliament, while I've asked the Parliament questions about the, the gender in, imbalance in higher science subjects, uh, the Minister glossed over the issue by looking at all science subjects together and stating it was not too bad. However, if we look at the science specifically, we have nearly double the amount of people taking higher chemistry provided uh, provision to physics. And of this taking physics, only 29% of them are female. Presiding officer, I find it, I find the state of affairs unacceptable and would argue that the Scottish government to urgently review the strategy on scientific education at all levels. Stuart Maxwell's comments are very helpful and I, I do genuinely wish him well in trying to redress some of the issues that uh, he spoke about today. But I have to say that uh, we need to make sure that our schools have the appropriate tools for the trade and make sure that our children get every opportunity to perform at the highest levels. The fact that schools are having to back borrow and steal equipment, the fact that they're having to resource uh, goods from out with the school budgets, uh, that's a damning uh, statement. Um, and I was not only shocked, but I continue to be horrified that that is still the state of affairs in our schools today. Now, uh, it's already been indicated that some of the councils have just got as much responsibility as the Scottish Government, but I think that's unfair. We, you can't tie schools' hands behind their backs and then expect them to perform. So I, I'm hoping that the Minister is going to be able to give me the assurances that he will, uh, like Stuart Maxwell, do the best he can to try to re reverse the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I now call Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to start, um, like others, by congratulating Ian Gray for securing the debate tonight um, on the Scottish Science Education Report published by the Learned Societies Group. The report makes stark reading against the backdrop of the prediction um, highlighted by Liz Smith that, that by 2030, over 7 million jobs in the UK will depend on science skills. And those STEM jobs are exactly the kind of jobs that we need, high quality, um, highly skilled and highly paid jobs, which other emerging economies will struggle to compete with us for. And yet here, where we have that competitive advantage, um, I don't think we're, we're choosing to follow that through. By 2030, the four and five-year-olds who will start primary school this summer will already be in work or possibly in the final years of university study and about to enter the jobs market. Um, but the same pupils with the same academic ability, the same aptitude for science in England will have enjoyed over 10 years of state education with 80% more per head spent on science in primary school and 27% more per head spent on science in um, secondary school if current spending levels continue. And that's a massive head start in building the necessary skills to compete for those seven million jobs. The, the, teaching, the science teaching situation has been described by my colleague as a, as a perfect storm. And it's hard to disagree with that, looking at the stats and the commentary provided within the science education reports. It states that, um, as I've said, that spending on science is significantly lower than in England that in 57% of schools um, they don't have sufficient equipment to carry out lessons, 44% of primary and 80% of secondary schools are unhappy with the level of funding for practical science lessons, and 98% of all schools have sought additional external funding from parents or, or teachers or other sources. Now, that issue alone, where 98% of schools have sought external funding, is likely to have a bigger impact in more deprived areas where parents aren't in a position to contribute to their own child's education, something flagged up by Hans Ala Malik. And if the report is accurate on that specific point, and I take on board what the Minister said about the small sample size and not being able to, to maybe do as an in-depth um, analysis as we would like, but I'd, I'd be interested in the Minister's view and if they're going to take forward any further work 
um, on how the government would plan to tackle any educational inequality, which would then arise as a result of more affluent communities um, finding it easier to fund their school's science provision. The teacher numbers in, in science are, are also falling, and it's becoming harder to recruit new teachers, staff and pupil morale has been affected. And, um, there have been concerns outlined that some pupils might be less inclined to take up a science subject if it is perceived as being harder to pass and that overall exam grades could be um, affected. And at the same time, we've seen science and science support technician staff being reduced across the country, while local authority education departments are trying to save money and really focusing on, on their core functions. Yep, certainly. Nigel Tone. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm grateful for taking your intervention. I, I, I've been hearing this debate and listening to this debate, and it, it's, it's very interesting. I'm just reflecting that it seems to me that when I was young, science was perceived as being more difficult. When my children were young, the science subjects were perceived to be more difficult. If they're still perceived to be more difficult, I think that's partly, genuinely, because they are, because as I think Ian Gray mentioned, numeracy is part of this, and if you're not particularly numerate, then science is not something that's going to come naturally to you. So I think uh, I'd like to suggest to the member and indeed to the chamber that there is an element of difficulty in here which children quite rightly see and which we have therefore to accommodate. Matt Griffin. I take that board, and I think that's reflected in the, the levels of pay that science graduates and engineering graduates are paid, that there is that uh, level of difficulty in simply of reflecting some of the concerns um, that have been borne out that it, it may be getting to the point where the funding of um, science subjects and practical science is then making it even more difficult, perhaps, for when the member or myself was at school studying those subjects. And I, I don't want to um, just have a, a negative speech here um, about the, the challenges that we face, but I come back to this um, my original point and what should be the massive, massive positive driver to improve science provision in schools, and that is those seven million high-skilled, high-paid jobs dependent on science in the UK by 2030. Now, some of the young people who will access those jobs haven't even started school yet. And that gives us um, the opportunity to address the issues um, that science teachers uh, and pupils are facing. None of those issues mentioned in the, the report are insurmountable, and I look forward um, to working with the Education Committee next week as we hear some of that evidence and with the Minister and look forward to hearing how he, he takes forward this um, science teaching agenda. Thank you. Many thanks. And can I now invite Dr Alistair Allen to respond to the debate at Minister around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank Ian Gray for tabling the motion on the Learning Societies Group report on science education. Uh, and I would certainly concur with him uh, in his view that we should be celebrating uh, the achievements of James Clark Maxwell in this uh, year, which has been designated the Year of Light, uh, to ensure that very commemoration. The survey that we are talking about this evening uh, contributes to the picture on the delivery of science education in our schools alongside other evidence, such as Education Scotland's 3 to 18 uh, Sciences Impact Review. And the government recognises the importance which science and broader STEM education plays in our schools. There is a strong connection between STEM learning and our economic growth sectors, a, a point touched on by Liz Smith and other speakers this evening. And so Curriculum for Excellence ensures that all our learners build a grounding across the range of STEM subjects through the broad general education and then have the opportunity to study for relevant national qualifications. Through learning in real life context, broader context, again referred to by Liz Smith's Curriculum for Excellence also helps to ensure that young people build an awareness of the careers which STEM sectors can offer uh, and the pathways into those jobs. And particularly, Stuart Maxwell referred to uh, it is important uh, that we constantly have a, a concentration on ensuring that uh, all our young people uh, view science careers as being open to them and recognise particularly uh, the importance of encouraging young women into science careers. I thought in a thoughtful contribution from Elaine Murray, uh, she touched on many issues, but not least on the connection between science and school and our wider national and international scientific research uh, achievement. 
The picture in schools, the picture for science qualifications, is very positive in terms of both their uptake and their attainment. And with respect, there is simply no evidence, uh, if I can use a scientific phrase, uh, that schools or pupils are being put off from taking science qualifications. Last year, we saw an increase in entries at higher in all three of the main sciences, biology, chemistry and physics, uh, with pass rates holding strong. It is difficult to reconcile any of that, I must say, uh, with some of the claims in today's motion uh, that uh, schools might regard pupils taking science subjects uh, as a threat to their pass rates. I will. Les Smith, I, I think he's right. I think there are some good signs about uh, the numbers taking higher and advanced higher in the science subjects. However, there is a big disconnect at the moment about the science uh, baccalaureate, and that plays very much to the theme of curriculum for excellence. How is he going to address that particular problem? Minister. Well, where I would uh, agree with the member is in the need to promote take-up of the science baccalaureate. I, I wouldn't agree with her in some of the, the assessments she makes of the, the quality or the, the robustness of the baccalaureate itself. But as with uh, the baccalaureate, as with uh, other awards uh, that um, are being promoted, I, I fully agree about the need to promote take-up. And I, I do also believe that uh, the uh, uptake for sciences amongst uh, S4 pupils does remain uh, very good. And the proportion of passes uh, within uh, science uh, at SCQF level 5 in 2014 is broadly the same, it should be said, as 2013. This positive picture is also borne out in uh, the Learning Societies Group's uh, survey results. We continue to provide a range of support for STEM learning and science qualifications including relevant resources and materials, uh, the STEM Central website with links to STEM careers and the TIG TAG science resource for primary. The Scottish Government also provides direct funding of, importantly, £900,000 per annum to CERC, the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre, to support the professional learning of primary and uh, secondary teachers and also technicians. And this includes uh, a programme focused on primary teachers to raise the, the confidence and skills in science which some of the members spoke about this evening. In terms of uh, the uh, debate uh, and in terms of uh, the issue around funding, members will of course be aware, and some of them have referred to it, that the vast majority of funding for primary and secondary schools funding comes as part of the annual local government uh, finance settlement, something which, of course, uh, has been part of the debate around the budget that uh, we've just been talking about. And it is, of course, the responsibility of individual authorities to manage their budgets and to allocate the financial resources available to them. The Learning Societies Group survey, significant though it is, does not provide a national picture uh, on the level of science expenditure. It sampled approximately 2% of Scottish state primary schools and 13% of state secondary schools. The report itself highlights this caveat, saying that the findings should be treated with caution and purely as an indication, and we should bear that in mind. It is worth highlighting some of the positives from the survey, uh, and for instance, I uh, will, I'm sure it will be a positive he highlights. Ian Gray. Well, it is really, because I think the, uh, the point the Minister makes is well made, that this was a small sample, and the report itself says that it's a small sample. Uh, surely the response to that would be not to dismiss its findings then, but rather perhaps the government might consider a wider sample which would give us a clearer picture and more evidence of whether uh, what the Learned Societies found was, is in fact the national picture or not. Minister. Well, uh, I, I certainly would not be dismissive uh, of uh, uh, the, the report. I certainly wouldn't be dismissive of the work that's gone into it. And I, I certainly uh, keep up a, a very positive relationship uh, with the Learning Societies and with uh, the Royal Society, Society of Edinburgh on these issues. One of the issues that has been raised, however, in the course of this debate is the making of comparisons with other places. Um, and while Mr Malik was uh, rightly raising the importance of physics as a subject, uh, I did feel that, like Mr Griffin, in making some of the comparisons that were made in this debate with England, uh, the comparisons were at least open to question. The figures quoted for spending in science in schools uh, do not, for instance, include the small matters of teachers training and their science centres. So where the Scottish Government would agree uh, with uh, the uh, Learning Societies is, however, on the importance of the dialogue that we need to have uh, between us. 
I want to conclude by just giving a word about the science centres. As I mentioned, I think they are one of the jewels in the crown of science in schools and more generally throughout Scotland. I'm happy to note also the importance of science festivals, not least the one in Mr Gray's uh, constituency, whose funding was increased, I'm pleased to say. Uh, and against the backdrop of cuts from another place, I believe that uh, the commitment that this government has for science is, is borne out. Uh, the work that we have done with Education Scotland uh, and our uh, other agencies ensures that we have good cause uh, to feel pride in the teaching and learning of science in our schools. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the inquiries debate on Learned Society's Group on Scottish Science Education Report. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.